a very good morning to one and all. I am here to extend a warm welcome. <laughs> the president of the program professor c vani dean in charge school of social sciences humanities and management to come on to the dais I am extremely happy to invite today's speaker, Professor G. Mamta Sagar, to please come on to the dais. Now I invite the head of the department. Professor V. Nirmala to come on to the dais. It gives me immense pleasure to invite Dr. G. Vijay Lakshmi, the donor of this incoming lecture. Welcome, ma'am. Bharati and my esteemed colleagues in the Department of English and my dear students. I'm happy to associate with this second endowment lecture instituted in fond memory of Gottupati Sindhu, Vimala, 
Subbarao on socio-political junctures of poetry and translation. I congratulate the donor, Ms. G. Vijayalakshmi, for instituting the endowment in her, in her alma mater. Uh, such lectures aim to promote academic excellence within the classrooms and scientific information exchange among students. So now I request. Uh, the speaker, Professor Mamata Sagar and Dr. Nirmala, the head of the department. Parliament that was conducted in uh, Amaravati way back in 2017. Okay, the list goes on like this. Apart from all these details, I would just like to share one detail about Dr. G. Vijay Lakshmi. We commonly hear, or at least sometimes, we get to hear scholars saying, uh, I'm lucky to have uh, worked under the guidance of such and such a supervisor. That at least we get to hear. But you hardly ever hear a supervisor, a research guide acknowledging that he or she is lucky to have supervised a scholar. But I belong to that one of that rare you know, category of research guide. I really feel privileged that I got the opportunity to supervise uh, Dr. G. Vijay Lakshmi. I say this not to please her or not to. I say this because she was a source of inspiration for me. Uh, I'll just tell you one instance. She wanted to come in person and attend this, but three days ago, she fell seriously sick. She had to be rushed to the hospital. But even then, she told me, you know, I didn't want to allow this pain to stop me from doing what I want to do. So I have decided to come and she has come. And that is the spirit. So she continues to be a source of inspiration for me, even years after she has finished her PhD from the department. So now, coming to say a few words about uh, Sindhu, Vimala and Subba, Gotipati Subbarao, in whose memory she has instituted this uh, endowment. Sindhu, Dr. G. Vijayalakshmi's bright and charming son, 
was an intelligent and mature boy who sadly and unfortunately departed the world young at the age of 16 uh, of an undiagnosed health condition. Though he is no longer around, he lives permanently in the hearts of all those who loved him dearly. Gotipati Vimala, Dr. Vijay Lakshmi's mother, was a homemaker and she was known for her exceptional culinary skills. She made sure that everything she cooked was as nutritive as it was tasty. She was a loving and caring sister, wife, mother, and a grandmother. She died in 2013. Gotipati Venkata Subbarao, born in the year 1938, served in the irrigation department for several decades till his retirement in 1996. So committed he was to his job and so amiable a person he was that it was hard to forget him for the people of the villages where he worked during his service. Known for his simplicity, he always wore only khadis. He was an epitome of self-discipline and concern for others. His concern extended not only to humans, but equally to animals, plants, and to the resources of the planet. Unlike most of us today, he lived in such a way that he consumed less than what he could produce. Slogans like save water, save energy, don't waste time were all default practices at home. His day would start at 4 a.m. and he was the engineer, gardener, electrician, plumber, and carpenter of the house. The entire house except the kitchen was his workshop. In a nutshell, Gotipati Subbara was a caring, committed, and hardworking person from whom his daughter has fortunately inherited the trait of giving back with gratitude to those who make our lives better. And the proof of it lies in the present endowment she has given to the department. As the proud daughter of Gotipat Vimala and Subbarao, Dr. G. Vijayalakshmi lives in Bangalore and much to our pleasure, she is with us today for the lecture. Thank you. Urdha. A very pleasant morning to all of you. I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, Professor G. Mamata Saga, who is a multifaceted personality, being a very eminent poet, translator, and then a script, write, script writer, and also an activist. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
and 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 she, she has published many creative writings to cite a very few hide and seek is a bilingual collection of selected <laughs> in collaboration with artist yen pushpamala first performed in kannada at samuha artist project and she has also written uh, in, uh, uh, she has also done some work on films and video works like song slaughter poetry installation uh, pa for power that means performance art Festi festival curated exhibition wellington new zealand and her poetry videos featured at the singapore translation symposium commonwealth foundation and singapore book council and a poetry film knock on the door and other poems indian cultural forum and language clashes, clashes its tips a video poem based on kannada translation of the poet and three poetry films titled interventions one two and three produced with history films uh, as part of the wales india collaborative projects in 2018 and he also produced a poetry video mother and me for bengaluru in 2018 and she attended many seminars conferences within and outside the country and she delivered lot of uh, lectures and also she conducted nearly uh, 20 workshops on poetry and translation and uh, her translation activity also includes 25 publications in various national and international journals and books to re to cite a very few uh, the tra uh, he, he tra she translated emily dickinson's poem 870 into kannada for the emily dickinson project by John Burchill and Jennifer McCamley in 2011. And she also translated Seamantha short story in Kannada by Nagaveni into English for the British Council's website on women writing and Samyukta, a journal of women's studies. And her awards and honors, of course, she has received so many awards and honors. I'm just reading a very few. Her translation of Elif Sheikh's The 40 Rules of Love in Kannada is confirmed, confirmed, conferred with prestigious Bhasha Bharati Translation Award in 2019. And she has been conferred with the Sanchi Hanamaya Kava, Kavya Prasthati in 2019. And she has been conferred with Gudibandi Purnima Award for the best poet of the year in 1999. And she is the recipient of National Junior Fellowship for Literature from Government of India. And she has also received a Sri Padaka gold medal. Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Thank you, Nirmala, for bringing me here. And uh, I know this is a very special uh, uh, endowment lecture. And I hope uh, my uh, presentation will do justice to um, the space. Uh, Socio-political junctures of poetry and translation. Um, you can start it. Thank you. Yeah. Go to the next slide. Oh, that would be good. Better. Thank you. Translating poetry is to translate one's own, one's own political stance. It allows gain extra energy to... like a wife, nurture like a mother, in the sense, if there is an original text, the translator has to be like, obedient like a wife, loyal to the husband like that, and nurture like a mother, and like a slave, work to the satisfaction of the owner. So these were the definitions for translation. So gradually those things changed and at least with people like us, women into the world of translation, it has to change. So um, then the... <laughs> that shows you what is getting translated into culture. So that's how the translation, now I would like to now present, uh, my presentation is based on what is getting translated, translated into culture in different point of time, in different junctures of history. And I would use literature as lens to look at it. I would like to understand translation um, as not simply an engagement between two or more languages, but as an idea of documenting the time, translation of me, translation for me is an active engagement with a given culture through poetry. And also using poetry as a tool to look at the time, look at what is getting translated into culture and look at translation itself. The Indian context begins to take a form 
from the particular juncture in the history when india was formed you know india uh, was formed in 1947 okay before that it was something else but india as such politically becomes india in 1947 if i consider this as the focal point then for it there is a past and also a future so this construction of the nation construction of india happens uh, simultaneously looking at the past and the future and something that is happening in the given time so um, the past was so then what is the past and what is the future the past was reimagining uh, past was reimagined only to imagine or construct the future so you know everything from the past was drawn into the present to construct the future therefore the socio political junctures furthermore translate the imagined and reimagined contexts and conditions although poetry has been an efficient tool documenting commenting critiquing re reacting voicing and translating times and the historical transitions we have come across religion and politics are two important themes that have nurtured indian poetry not just poetry nurtured indian politics nurtured indian uh, um way of understanding what is india who is an indian everything religion and politics are the two important themes that have nurtured indian poetry poetry in turn has directed the socio political responses and then references from kannada language poetry could give us a better clarity of what i intend to say now epic poems like ramayana and mahabharata have been part and parcel of indian sentiments so if you know no uh, you will be asked to behave like certain characters you will be asked to be loyal like certain characters and you will be also asked not to be very courageous like certain characters from mahabharata and ramayana so uh, epic poems like ramayana and mahabharata have been part and parcel of indian sentiments but what we need to remember the need to i would like to bring in some of the kannada bharatas and uh, i would also want to now um, establish that the southern bharatas and ramayanas um in a way resist the northern version of bharata and ramayana so all the villains become heroes and uh, heroes become villain things are changed and uh, the racist uh, perspective of characters is cancelled so let us look at it the 5th century epic poetry vikramarjuna vijaya by pampa kavi a version of mahabharata was commissioned uh, to pampa kavi by his ruler arikesari arikesari was equated in in pampa's mahabharata this ruler arikesari who commissioned him was appropriated and equated with arjuna hero of he is the hero of pampa's bharata so arikesari becomes the hero of pampa's bharata arjuna becomes the hero of pampa's bharata and one we should remember is pampa was a jaina poet okay so uh, now today we will say that uh, we have uh, two epics ramayana and mahabharata which represent india and which are also associated with the hindu epics but there were jains jains jainism has uh, uh, contributed the maximum to the kannada literature you know the understanding of kannada literature so pampa was a jaina kavi and uh, in his work vikramarjuna vijaya he challenges the vedic traditions by reverting narratives of vyasa bharata duryodhana the villain is almost a hero in pampas uh, uh, vikramarjuna vijaya uh, karna is celebrated flaws of the pandava princes are showcased by pampa 
they are not just celebrated versions of mahabharata have appeared at different junctures of time along socio political and philosophical intentions needs and issues ranna is another jaina kavi ranna kavi's gada yuddha from 10th century and the kumara vyasa's gadugina bharata from 15th century are two other texts that need mentioning here adi purana by pampa ajitanatha purana by ranna anantanatha purana and yashodara charite by janna kavi were commissioned to spread jainism all these texts along with the versions of bharatas i mentioned are still alive and are celebrated in kannada literary traditions religious beliefs and urges the document the regime also led to the translation translation and translations of these texts many many poems based on the characters from jaina literature has come up in kannada you know many um, uh, poems actually which refer to pampa janna uh, ranna the jaina kavis are still being written in kannada okay so now let us come to ramayanas like mahabharata here i would like to go one step beyond kannada like mahabharata there are many versions of ramayana kambans ramavataram in tamil from the 12th century tunchan elathunchans adhyatma ramayana in malayalam and kumara valmiki or naraharis torave ramayana in kannada in the 16th century and tulsi ramacharita manasa in hindi that is 17th century are some of the versions of ramayanas that have surfaced initiating bhakti in the context of socio political reasons like religion caste power and authority in india uh, and all these uh, ramayanas most of them you know are recreated rewritten transcreated for certain reasons it's without reason every juncture of history has its own reason for example ulasi's ramayana uh, as you know begins with uh, those lines everybody knows this i hope that um, like you beat the chande more you beat the drums more it sounds better that is how you have to treat uh, women and uh, uh, untouchables beat them up let them learn well tulasi ramayana begins with that well so um, the magnum opus of ramayana darshanam Uh, from the 19th century by kuempu a very well known uh, kannada uh, poet and a writer is one such celebrating rama as a kind human being dashasana swap dashash dashasana swapna siddhi is a chapter a beautiful chapter introducing nuances of ramana's efficiency as a king and a kind human being sitayana by polanki ramamurthy and chitrapata ramayana but by h s venkatesh murthy are perspectives of the narratives from sita's point of view the ramayana from a sita's point of view as a wife daughter a friend and an independent woman so you know there is a a, a cluster of texts which have been created in different junctures and people draw from that and recreate ramayanas and mahabharatas and you know when sita had never got a perspective there are many many poems i think all languages all indian languages have these poems uh, which are from the perspective of sita <laughs> created are being uh, uh, misread misled by political uh, perspectives therefore it's very important for us to 
uh, reappropriate it and uh, accept, take it and rework on it. Translating philosophical, political, and social com uh, commitments. 12th century was a very important uh, juncture in the Kannada socio political and literary times. Vachanas uh, are, Vachana, as it says, it is the speech to say, you know. So, Vachanas are very short. Uh, poetry like sayings later on in the 19th century when uh, uh, literary And is um, because of language, you know, those who could not uh, reach the language or those who could not uh, reach uh, the higher uh, strata of the society were never given any option to reach anything. Always the higher strata of the society had a reach to the God. And therefore, you know, uh, during the Vachana or whatever was said in Sanskrit was said in Kannada so that people could understand, people could reach God. The best part of the Vachana movement is it's a Shaivite movement and uh, it allows people to imagine their own Shiva. There is no special one Shiva, you know, like uh, Sule Sankave is one of the Vachana, Vachana, Vachana Karas and she, Sule is a prostitute, you know. So, uh, Sule Sankave imagined her Shiva as Nirlajeshwara, Ishwara without Lajja. You know, so beautiful, you know, it's, it's, it's like that. And uh, so uh, this liberal new wave Shaivism allowed its followers to imagine their own form of Shiva along the occupation they were engaged with. The intention of the whole thing is it was Bijala's, uh, Bijala the king, Basavanna was the treasurer. And Basavanna said, Kayakave Kailasa, work is worship. Work, don't believe in anything. God is not big. The disciples are big. Uh, God happens because God has a disciple. If there is a bhakta, only then there is a God. Without bhakta, there is no God. So, you know. Uh, <laughs> of them it is part of the um, uh, classical music as well you know and uh, uh, prundar dasa kanaka dasa and one thing i would like to say is about kanaka dasa here kanaka dasa kanaka was not a brahmin kanaka was a, a shepherd and uh, um, uh, there is a story saying that he was not allowed in the temple in udupi if you have gone to udupi you will know that the krishna 
the murti of the krishna the idol of krishna he is doesn't face him. ஒரு <laughs> of the time and used bhakti the devotion as an efficient tool to communicate with the masses today what we do is we only see bhakti we don't see the bhakti as a tool which will talk about the social and uh, political realms that it worked bhakti was not bhakti bhakti was mainly talking to the people about stop misbehaving you know instead we are using today we are using these texts to misbehave with people misbehave with the communities misbehave with people marginalized everything bhakti again seeps into the nationalist um, movement that imagined our land as mother goddess in patriotic poems religion and politics have gone hand in hand all through transcreating imaginations of rama rajya tamil and kannada literary contexts glorify ravana as the dravidian king as against rama the aryan valmiki's ramayana that imagines villains vamps and the other differently in the con- uh, is contested by reimagining the concept of rama rajya likewise bharatas are imagined outside hastinavati or the context of pandavas rama rajya imagined by gandhi had the pious rama as we know i am showing in the image rama was a family man there was this little hanumanta very cute monkey always with him supporting him you know and a, a beautiful sita next to him and lakshmana <laughs> there was peace and happiness and justice prevailed accompanied by lakshmana and wife sita and hanuman the monkey devotee he strived for the well being of the citizens rama the king strived for the well being of his citizens whoever they were what <laughs> and hanumanta is become this and uh, whichever form one imagines rama rajya it needs a ravana always identified as a demon king and his sister shurpanaka who needs to be tamed and taught the lesson a nation and its memories associated with it imagined as a secular space is now being replaced by the amnesia of sponsored violence in the name of religion and in the name of tradition so what is getting translated into culture is this not the rama rajya which was imagined i would now quickly want to see how poetry politics and translation get connected in recent times 
during the latest kannada karnataka election campaigns political parties were seen to be revisiting vachanas and frequently invoking basavanna and the, and claiming his legacies strangely even those political parties who thrive on agendas of religious and social discriminations have been quoting basavanna you know basavanna always said we don't need discriminations those political parties who are whose agenda is to discriminate and send people away from the country he is quoting basavanna basavanna was a social reformer an activist and a saint from the 12th century who discarded his brahminical identities and argued for a non hierarchical society his message was inclusive and argued for a diverse society and rejected an exclusive state favoring one caste and one religion but he has been quoted again and again by people who don't understand him he would have never agreed on an idea of an exclusive hindu rashtra or building mandirs at the cost of violating human rights for him legs are pillars he never be- believed in building temples he said god is inside you you know legs are pillars body the shrine head the golden pinnacle the stagnant perishes while those wander across barrier sustain references to basavanna and the movement he led allows us to at least dream of and hope for a for an egalitarian society at this point of time annihilation of caste is the foundation of sharana movement led by basavanna it seems to have simultaneously addressed problems arising out of the caste society giving access to specific powerful communities caste and gender alone to the philosophical and social milieus through depriving the marginalizing and the other and common people the sharana movement is a reformist movement as it attempted to address class caste and to some extent gender issues in a given societal milieu of course it marks a rupture with the then prevailing dominant religious and social uh, mores documented in vachanas the oral texts produced by vachanakaras goggave is another vachanakara she says if breast and braids come they call it a woman if mustache and lion cloth come they call it a man the knowledge of this duality is it a man or a woman the atma is it a man or a woman you know um, men and women sharanas from the untouchable caste and downtrodden communities were the force of the varna movement basavanna identifies himself as one among them he says my father is madara chennayya dohara kakkayya my elder uncle chikkayya da uncle my elder brother is kinnari bommayya why do you not know me as such kudala sangayya i am not individual i am made of all these people from all different untouchable castes so let us cancel the whole notion of untouchability men and women sharanas from the untouchable castes uh, and downtrodden communities um, so i mean uh, supported this such an a movement the movement gave the oppressed and the downtrodden a hope of equality and courage to nurture this dream basavanna encouraged men and women from lowest of the lower caste to practice social equality and actively participate in building and contributing towards a healthy society treasures of philosophical knowledge wrapped in sanskrit and kept away from the commoners unraveled in kannada during basavanna's time god and bhakti the trained untouchable untouchable for many were made accessible god started walking beyond sanctum sanctorum of the temple and lived amidst people fear of god was replaced with love affection and humanitarian concern god and bhakti were powerful tools used to fight social discrimination and to keep harmony and within the sharana communities which were intercaste and interreligious in nature you have heard of akmaha devi nale baruvudu namage inde barali indu baruvudu namage igale barali 
ಆಗೀಗ ಎನ್ನದಿರು ಚನ್ನ ಮಲ್ಲಿಕಾರ್ಜುನ ವಾಟ್ಸ್ ಟು ಕಮ್ ಟುಮಾರೋ ಲೆಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಕಮ್ ಟುಡೇ ವಾಟ್ಸ್ ಟು ಕಮ್ ಟುಡೇ ಲೆಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಕಮ್ ರೈಟ್ ನಾವ್ ಲಾರ್ಡ್ ವೈಟ್ ಎಸ್ ಜಾಸ್ಮಿನ್ ಡೋಂಟ್ ಗಿವ್ ಅಸ್ ಯುವರ್ ನೋಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ದೆನ್ಸ್ ವೈಲ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ವೈ ಆರ್ ಮೈ ಸ್ಟ್ರೆಸಿಂಗ್ ಸೋ ಮಚ್ ಆನ್ ವಾಚನ್ ಅಸ್ ಈಸ್ ವೆನ್ ವಿ ರೀಕನ್ಸ್ಟ್ರಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಥಾಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಫ್ಯೂಚರ್ ಥಾಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಟೈಮ್ ಡ್ರಾಯಿಂಗ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ಪಾಸ್ಟ್ ವಿ ಫಗಾಟ್ ಆಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದೀಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಎವರ್ ಟಾಕ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಇಕ್ವಾಲಿಟಿ ಅಂಡ್ ಅಗೇನ್ಸ್ ದ ಸೋಷಿಯಲ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕ್ರಿಮಿನೇಷನ್ ವಾಸ್ ನೆವರ್ ಕನ್ಸಿಡರ್ಡ್ ದಟ್ಸ್ ವೈ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಸ್ಟ್ರೆಸಿಂಗ್ ಆನ್ ದಿಸ್ ವೈ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಕಂಟ್ರಿ ಆರ್ ಎಟ್ ಟು ಬಿ ರೆಸ್ಕ್ಯೂಡ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಸೋಷಿಯಲ್ ಸ್ಟಿಗ್ಮಾಸ್ ಆಫ್ ರೆಲಿಜನ್ ಕಾಸ್ಟ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಜೆಂಡರ್ ಅಟ್ಯಾಚ್ ಟು ದೆಮ್ ಹಿಯರ್ಸ್ we have all these baggages we really know that we are important we are not somebody who can be discarded we also know that we should not do the caste discrimination with all these in mind we need to approach the text you will be giving the new reading of the text instead of mugging whatever is asked you to read so a text has to be approached from the context of the time um using kannada uh, which was people's language to deliver and attain philosophical deliberations as against sanskrit a language of high caste hindus in itself was a major political move vachanas were composed in kannada vachanakaras spoke voiced documented and uh, resisted uh, through their words what else do you want if you have the freedom to imagine your own god in your own way along your experience and interpretation the minute you reimagine the god in a different way people will come <laughs> ಸರಿ <laughs> 
the day he talked about window and not about the door as she thought when he mentioned wall she thought he was talking about open space was it because everything is open when a wall is broken she made payasam she knew he would like he ate it thinking it was prayatam Why is everything so topsy turvy? Was there no wind blowing from one to the other, and so no waves? Heads down, words in water, send out a forlorn cry. It was then that suicide was mentioned. What did he say? He found it funny, didn't he? That is the way it so it is sometimes. You see. a thing turns out to be something else the sea isn't a sea and what we thought was the shore is only the back of the fish be honest and tell me which one of us two is more insane she asked he asked in turn what did you say is it the one who wants to die first it's so hot shall i open the window so that the wind blows between us she asked what did you say he asked did you say you are hungry and <laughs>
like a flowing river it never divides the land you should remember this anything should not divide the land instead connect both the banks lying on either sides it is important to spread the urge of this flow among young minds it would like to i would like to share a few slides from my poetry projects that i do with the uh, wherever i am internationally or within india or in bangalore this particular thing is something which uh, we we wrote a series of poems on bangalore city visited places and uh, the third one which is the center one center image of a man is uh, the image of one man called trivikrama mahadeva trivikrama mahadeva has been recently he died he has been collecting unclaimed dead bodies in the city of bangalore and doing funerals for that body that's what he does he does and he is a very very poor man and uh, abdul kalam gave him uh, award or something and then abdul kalam gave him one van where he could carry the body that's all we interviewed him and wrote about him and this uh, exhibition was inaugurated by trivikrama mahadevan we invited him with the family and he inaugurated this it's a massive exhibition in kaban park metro station no and uh, and uh, uh, the first uh, the first one is a library very famous library in uh, bangalore and then it is the lal bag uh, flower show and uh, tipu palace and uh, and there is a famous bakery in bangalore a very old one so poems were written about these and in the metro station we displayed this and on the walls when the train comes we projected poems on the walls and when the train came it was on the door and when it opened it looked like people were coming out of the poems and they all waited and read this and asked us what it is so we could explain them that this this is these are poems but they are beyond poems they are not just poems they talk about how we need to behave how we need to not discriminate people how we need to respect women all these things we use poetry for doing that so um, can we go to the next one yeah uh, poetry translation uh, i said this already can we go to the next one please these are some of the performance uh, uh, poet performance that uh, i have been curating poetry translated into performance is an act of healing for me you know um, this one the first one is called poetry you only hear it poetry there you know we did uh, a tree and all the leaves were made in cloth and poems are written it's in a uh, major uh, collection on a display 
and the uh, other side the last one is a student of me who tried to put his poem in a visual uh, uh, possibility you know visual uh, this thing and uh, this is something which uh, below you for the scroll that we made so i just finished that uh, on um, saturday the whole evening till the evening and got it to the tree so this this is still on display today in bangalore and there are a lot of things just to scroll some 10 scrolls with poetry by uh, people who did the scrolls which is displayed and we also did a performance space in which uh, they uh, actually performed can we go to the next one um yeah next please this i would like to say is this is in colombo i was invited for a uh, festival uh, performance festival where you know um, one of my little poems is translated into sinhala and it's also translated into tamil so what i did was i used uh, three uh, mosquito nets kind of net and wrote uh, kannada behind that wrote in tamil then wrote in sinhala and edge was stitched we kept it and people could stitch on it so by the end of the exhibition it became like a carpet like a nice uh, this thing so the intention was there is a so much of political barrier between sinhala and tamil as you know no the jaffna wars and uh, colombo and jaffna never get along you know uh, i was there who visited both places i have poet friends from jaffna from colombo everywhere and so this was a symbolic kind of a gesture which brings peace that is how and poetry was also used so performances can speak more than anything else and it will be left like that it is again in the curate an event called kavya sanjay since 2013 uh, i started in bangalore this was started because uh, i was teaching in bangalore university where now i am teaching in shristi uh, manipal university before that from 20 from 9 2009 no from i don't know okay uh, 7 to 16 i think i taught in bangalore university and most of my students were usually from the really uh, economically not so strong uh, communities and they would travel along and come to bangalore and for doing masters you know they had should have really fought in the house and come especially girls and also men you know um, and they cannot just 
waste their time waste their money in a city like bangalore they would come to the college then go back come to the college go back come to the college go back and you know bangalore is such a cosmopolitan city that certain areas of bangalore is not considered is considered as um, like kannada speaking people uh, really don't dare going to those place like mg road or something yeah so south bangalore is for kannada speaking something is for tamil speaking it's kind of psychologically divided so what i did was i took all my kannada students to mg road and on the footpath there was this mg road uh, metro when the metro began there is a cultural center they invited me i put up a mic and all they started reading kannada poems loudly the vehicles that were going stopped people got down and came oh my god people are reading kannada here you know then we opened it for people people from youngsters who read who write poems in any language in bangalore come to kavya sandeep it's not just a kannada thing and also i corrected it i told people who are like uh, there are some groups uh, which are uh, um, kannada shavanist groups for them i said if people have to learn your language accommodate them so we have tamil malayalam telugu french german hindi english uh, uh, vietnamese all kinds of languages people come and write poems and present here in public spaces and with we work with the communities so that is how uh, we do and also translation yet another thing i want to say is translation is not just between two languages on the page it happens beyond the page it sees what is getting translated into culture so i am showing three covers here cover page of my books okay uh, elif shafaq's 40 rules of love which got me the translation award preeti and nalvathini magalu i almost uh, did a research of two and half years to bring out this book this book i think everybody should read this book 40 rules of love by elif shafaq this book is uh, is about rumi the poet uh, elif shafaq uh, lives in uh, appraisal in turkey and how and about the sufism and about uh, uh, the whirling dance that the sufis do it's a very very poetic interesting book so to understand that i should have understood quran until and unless you really you, otherwise also you can read but if you really want to jump into the detail you need to know quran so first thing i did was i read versions and versions of quran um, to help of people understood it you know and so i knew quran stories so immediately there is a uh, reference i will understand that much first thing i did then what i did was when i read it i felt it's very important to bring this into my language into my country into my socio political realm so this photograph is taken uh, at the taksim square in uh, istanbul when i went to istanbul actually there is a huge taksim square under that there are little little pebbles mounds and small pebbles i actually slept flat on the ground and shot it so this little mound is only this much it looks like a gumbal those small small ones who look like people are praying are small pebbles so i wanted elif shafaq's book cover is like a girl a modern girl walking towards the sea but my intention of translating is different my intention of translating is to introduce uh, introduce literature associated with islam for a proper reason against the hatred of uh, islam or against uh, um, uh, whatever so i had to i also wrote a long uh, introduction about why i am translating this book into kannada so there was a big and also gave a glossary of uh, uh, references from quran so that people can go back and read know what it is who the character is and all that so a lot of work is being done in this uh, book so designing this book was also extremely important for me to uh, communicate or to translate what the book is itself 
and uh, beyond barriers is a slovenian uh, interaction where uh, it has four uh, writers from slovenian and uh, kannada and when i went to slovenia i was invited to slovenia for a translation project and i found that there is there was uh, one very important poet uh, in slovenia mm, i right now i forget his name uh, he was um, arrested and he was tortured for writing against the state okay so before he died he went on scribbling in the jail and you know he went on writing in detail one word he went on writing went on writing that so i used that and his tension and the passion of writing as the cover so any slovenian person sees this they will connect with uh, that great writer that great poet who lost his life in jail who was tortured by the state okay and uh, the other one is um, Uh, uh, is is a collaboration between uh, india and wales where i was invited to bring out this book called introversion so i designed this so i also design books i do lot of things okay and i also dance okay not yeah so um so on the whole um so in the recent times uh, india is getting better spaces to represent poetry in languages beyond english at international uh, trans and and international translation activities institutes like commonwealth foundation literature across frontiers from the uk poets translating poets from uh, germany and many global forums are uh, interested in indian writing not just indian english writing as such and translations and uh, translation is not a simple exchange that happens between languages but an ex uh, engagement that addresses the nuances of a given linguistic culture there is a need to initiate active translation networks from within the country connecting regional languages this again calls for funds and other support structures design as translation um in collaboration with center for slovenian literature i had brought out trilingual edition of poems and short stories by four slovenian and two kannada writers put together and uh, designing a book or designing a poetry performance is to translate an idea into a visual form you know the text based on the visual form based on the text um translating poetry is like translating peace translated poetry needs a bit of care love and support i would like to repeat that an act of translating poetry is like bhakti the devotion towards attaining peace in this chaotic world translating poetry is a mode of sharing caring and distributing love and uninterrupted affection to sustain hope in this world in today's world translating poetry is voice against violence translating poetry is opposite to war and violence thank you
I do my daily work daily in the night and monthly in the morning. Wherever I am, I do my work. I do my work in the shop.
Okay, see yes. Turidu gorige, taki tu namedege. Dada dada, dada dada, dada dada, dada dada, dada dada. धड़ा धड़ा इसी गुंडू हरी वरक्त धकोड़ी नीला लल्ला दुनोड़ी हरी वरक्त धकोड़ी नीला लल्ला दुनोड़ी
ಎರಡಲ್ಲ ಸಾಲಾಗಿ ಏಳು ತೂರಿದ್ದು ಗೌರಿಗೆ ತಾಕಿದ್ದು ನಮ್ಮೆದೆಗೆ ತೂರಿದ್ದು ಗೌರಿಗೆ ತಾಕಿದ್ದು ನಮ್ಮೆದೆಗೆ ಧಡ ಧಡ ಇಸಿ ಗುಂಡು ಧಡ ಧಡ ಇಸಿ ಗುಂಡು
I extended our gratitude to Dr. Vijay Lakshmi Garu for her magnanimous and generous contribution towards this endowment lecture. This program might not have happened without her generous contribution. I thank you, Madam, once again for this kind gesture. And I profusely thank uh, Professor Vanta Sagar, ma'am, for giving green signal and to be with us today and for delivering us enriching, enlightening, and ins insightful lecture on socio-political junctures of poetry and translation. We're all enthralled, madam. It's spell-binding, to tell you. Okay, I'm profusely thankful for that. And uh, I thank, uh, um, I especially thank uh, faculty from other departments, Professor Uma Madam Garu, Professor Madhya Jyoti Garu, uh, and others who come from other departments. And I'm thankful to our own faculty from our department for uh, spending their uh, precious time on this academic uh, program. And uh, I deeply appreciate and thank you all, my dear scholars and students from other departments for uh, being with us and uh, taking a lot of enthusiasm to listen to this uh, enlightening lecture. I thank the technical staff for extend extending their uh, support for uh, the smooth sailing of this program. I thank one and all. If I missed anybody here, I'm sorry. I thank one and all, everybody here. And with this, I sign out. Thank you. Have a nice day. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, just a minute, just one more minute. I'll be failing in my duty if I don't thank Professor Sharada Madam of Dravidian University, who played a key role in bringing uh, Professor Mamata Madam here and we had an excellent time listening to her. Okay, thank you so much to Professor Sharda Madam of uh, Dravidian University. Okay, thank you. <laughs>